Hello, everybody. Um, thanks for coming to uh, a, a talk. Wait, 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 wait. I think we should come. <coughs> <laughs> um, thank you to the Art Basel team for inviting us for this uh, short uh, book launch uh, discussion, and uh, to Adnan uh, Yildiz, the director of uh, Kunstler Stuttgart, for participating in this discussion. With, uh, this is the first time we're doing this format. Um, I wanted to give a quick uh, introduction to the book before we get into the, in the and consecrate the largest portion of our time to the discussion. <laughs> um, Mola Nasruddin is a, is a book that we've recently published with uh, JRP uh, and Christoph Keller editions. It's uh, arguably the most important uh, Muslim periodical of the 20th century, insofar as it was read from uh, Morocco all the way to India. And it's a political satire in, from Azerbaijan or in Azerbaijani, but actually published first in Tbilisi, in present-day Georgia, and then in Baku. We came across uh, Mola Nasruddin uh, in Baku in 2008, and it's being reissued in, in exact facsimile, or almost exact facsimile, by the uh, Azeri government in an attempt to, uh, to um, forge a national identity for a, a relatively young republic that hasn't existed uh, except for quite short spurts before, the, before 1991. Um, Mola Nasruddin is, a, is actually a, a character um, that the magazine is named after. The character of Mola Nasruddin is a quite an interesting kind of transnational character. You can find a version of him everywhere from Bulgaria or Croatia, even all the way to China, and so uh, including the Middle East and Turkey, of course. And he's originally a Turkish kind of Sufi uh, wise fool uh, figure, kind of a court jester, the equivalent of a court jester, but also kind of, a, as we'll talk about later, somewhat of an early social critic. And uh, he's often shown um, riding on a donkey backwards, a typical Mullah Nasruddin story that, that adults tell their children or that adults tell each other uh, has many layers and uses the kind of first degree humor. A typical Mullah Nasruddin story is, for example, there's one person on, on, this, on one side of the river yelling to Mullah Nasruddin, Mullah Nasruddin, how do I get to the other side of the river? And he says, you are on the other side of the river. So the kind of very first degree uh, humor, almost slapstick, but behind which there's several levels of, uh, of interpretation, ethics, and uh, moral codes. Um, we, uh, we essentially chose the, um, the, the kind of 300 most, what we consider the most relevant illustrations of, out, of, of, out of about 5,000 or so, and translated them from Azeri into English for the, for basically to make them avail available for a large audience. Um, here you have the uh, Azeri women and, 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 uh, and European women at the time, or Russian women, sort of shirking from each other in horror. Um, the, the magazine was quite, uh, it, was, it had kind of like Honoré Daumier type illustrations of the Caucasus, and it was quite progressive, very, uh, very much for gender equality, very much for education. And actually, it believed in the idea of westernization as progress, which is quite problematic for us as Slavs and Tatars. Um, but um, but it's, uh, it's something that we'll discuss later. But it was actually quite critical of colonial policies at the same time. It happened to be a kind of a very much uh, exemplary of its time of this, um, when, when the Muslim world believed it had to import the ideas of the West in order to kind of catch up technologically with the advances in the West. Um, as you might be familiar with the Caucasus, this is where the magazine uh, really sprung out from in, in Tbilisi and then in a short stint in Tabriz and then in Baku. Of course, the Caucasus was for most of the 19th century under Russian rule and, uh, and most of the 20th century as well. But actually before that, it was part of kind of a greater Iran and, and the magazine's largest readership was actually in, uh, in Iran, where 30% of the population is ethnically Azeri. Um, so every, com every event in Iran of the early 20th century was commented or influenced somehow by this publication. Most importantly, there was the establishment of the Iranian or Persian constitutional revolution, which resulted in the first, uh, first elected parliament in Asia, um, actually. And, and this, they were very much under the kind of pushed by the progressive tone of, of Mullah Nasruddin. Uh, I should say that. The, the region of Iran, which is, progress, which is historically the most progressive, is, uh, is not just coincidentally also the Azeri region, maybe because of the proximity to Russia, um, or maybe for other reasons. Um, often, the, the magazine used, um, used animals as a kind of uh, stand-ins for colonial figures. Here you have the, the Ottoman Empire and the Persian Empire sort of battling it out in the foreground, while Fez or, or Fez, the Morocco, is being kind of bullied around by Europe on the right in a bull format and some foxes. Um, and I want to just end with uh, a couple points before we uh, get in, into the discussion. Is one is the Azeri, Azeri language. One of the most difficult uh, tasks of this book was 
trying to translate uh, from Azeri into English. And the reason why it was so difficult is that, as you can see here, it was even discussed in the page of the magazine, the Azeri language was forced down, was, sorry, the Russian language was forced down the throats of Azeris for a long time. And the strength of this publication was actually was so visually led. So quite a lot of people who were illiterate at the time could actually understand it. That was probably the coup of this, uh, of this particular publication. Um, the Azeri language was considered to be not a, not a proper uh, literary language. And the fact that the magazine was published in local Azeri as opposed to Istanbuli, Turkish, or Russian was a, was a big deal at the time. Of course, today, um, what we see is that the, the, we first fell in love with Molana Nasruddin actually through the kind of linguistic vicissitudes or tides of change. In 29, um, much, like the, the, much like in Turkey in 1928 when the Turkish alphabet was Latinized, the Azeri alphabet was written, as you can see on the top, in, in, in Arabic for a thousand years uh, until 1929. Lenin believed that the revolution of the East included Latinizing all the Muslim subjects or the Turkic subjects of, uh, of the Soviet Union. The only people who were not, who were not Latinized were Ar Armenian and Georgian, who happened to be the only Christian of that region. Uh, and so imagine sort of whole scale Latinizing. So basically everybody was asked to bring out their books that were previously written in Arabic, burn the books, and start to, to read, instead of reading from uh, right to left, from left to right, but the same language. Um, just logistically, it's quite, a, it's quite a nightmare, as you can imagine. Then, of course, Le uh, Stalin realized that he, he felt that people are becoming too westernized. So in 1939, he said, actually, let's serialize everything. So 10 years later, bring everything out again, burn it all again, and let's keep it from left to right this time, but let's do it in Cyrillic as opposed to uh, Latin. And then 1991, back to Latin. So on one page, you can see from the top to the bottom, you have Arabic, um, Cyrillic, and Latin. Um, this kind of inspired a work of ours that, uh, called Azeri, where we basically uh, took the kind of famous proverb, fool me once, shame on me, fool me twice, shame on you, and uh, said, fool me thrice, shame on Latin, so, uh, and, and just changing, the, maybe we should actually change the name of the Azeri language to uh, sort of ah, Azeri, to kind of to express the, the, the frustration in trying to, um, to get around this alphabet. Um, also, um, here's a, here you can see the three alphabets um, just encircled in red. The, the caption on the bottom is a, a, the doctors speaking to the mola saying, if you drink this medicine once every 100 years, you'll be cured. So it's, kind of a, it's a little bit of a parody of, the, of, of Islamic medicine at the time. Um, another quick uh, element that I think uh, it's good for us to address is the issue of women. The, 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 um, the publication was, was probably its biggest impact was, if not on the Iranian constitutional revolution, was on gender equality. And uh, it's a little known fact that Azerbaijan, actually women in Azerbaijan had the right to vote before women in the UK or the US and in Switzerland, definitely before the women in Switzerland. So um, in 1918, uh, women in Azerbaijan were given the right to vote. Again, it, it runs counter to this idea of, of or this kind of public image that we have or imagination of, of the Muslim world and, and women's rights. Um, and these are two of the other topics that we'll uh, look at. Just some of the illustrations on women. Here you have uh, two women looking at a prison saying, look how lucky they are, they have windows. Um, of course, there are windows behind bars, um, but their own houses don't have windows. And uh, here you have respects being paid to the bride on the left, but then a month later, the, the kind of husband definitely doing away with any sense of respect that he had earlier. And, um, and on the right, one of my favorites is a, is, a, is a mola telling a Japanese woman, no matter how much progress you've made, you'll never be, as, as, uh, you'll never be able to compare with Muslim women until you cover your face. And, uh, and another very interesting one is the one on the, on the left where a baby is, uh, is, is blackmailing his mom, saying, if you don't give me candy, I'll tell dad you looked out the window. So you kind of see how much it impacts the, uh, the dynamic of a child to a mother, this, uh, this gender inequality. And on the right, you have the Turks being very happy about their constitutional revolution, long live the Turkish constitution, and long live the reforms, until they realize that the reforms give women the right to, to gather. And of course, they, they kind of quickly shirk away saying, actually, we don't need this kind of reform. <laughs> um, so uh, I, wanted yeah, open yeah. Up, uh, the I wanted to open up the discussion with Adnan, who, who, uh, who has a, a, a long-standing relationship with Molan Asri in the character, and, um, and also the kind of an anti-modern figure. Uh, yeah, I'm born in Karaman, which is in the middle of Anatolia and Akshehir. From many historical sources, it's the official place that Molan Nasreddin lived in Anatolia. So in a way, when I met with Slavs and Tatars and especially did research about Molan Nasreddin, this was a different form of Santa Claus kind of uh, relationship, like 
I think every country has their own kind of figure like this. But for, for us, it was also a kind of main figure in the, the, let's say, official or like the national educational uh, discourse. It's part of it. Somehow you see how it has been integrated into the discourse. It has been how it has been used and in, uh, instrumentalized into different courses from a pedagogical view. Uh, but And then secondly, here I kind of position my role as a kind of reader who goes to the bookstore and just have a couple of minutes to run through your publications since this is a lounge. So I want to ask very basic questions to kind of transmit the physicality of the book here for the people. And first I want to ask you a very direct question. Like when we go to the table of contents, uh, we see different chapters. So it is, like, we are talking about a collective for the ones who arrived later, Slavs and Tatars, who, who is dealing with a book uh, who is dealing with a long-term publication called Mola Nasreddin. And Mola Nasreddin is a kind of, let's say, critical figure which has a long life f through many years. And so the publication is taking this critical figure as a kind of identity and developing a discourse through the years, through political satire. So uh, in a way, you choose a kind of very modernist, very, let's, let, let's say, classical way of editing the selection, like this huge collection. You, you worked on this. Why? are you into these themas, let's say? Yeah, I mean, the, the, these categories, I should, it's a good point. We, we were the ones who gave these categories just to create some order in a, in a, in a, in a book of, let's say, 300 odd pages. The original uh, archive, of course, is over 5,000 pages, and we just felt it was, we are first, Slavs and Tatars actually started out as a reading group. So the first thing we do when we, we look at a book is go to the table of contents, and I think it's, there's a, there's, we often, are, uh, often, more often than not, maybe be, can believe in this sort of very Texan phrase of, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And, uh, and there's nothing wrong with tables of contents. And uh, there's, no, there's no need to maybe mash this up and make it a kind of a hodgepodge of different uh, a disorder that maybe you would expect from an artist book. And I don't mm -hmm. think that, uh, I think in some sense, what's interesting about this book is that it's not particularly an art book, uh, and maybe people have asked, why don't you intervene into the pages? And I think that well, the, the very basic answer is that it's, it's just bringing it to, to the people's attention is, is enough of a gesture, mm -hmm. I think, in this, in this case, and there's no but need. It, it's a librarian approach, we can say. It's a, it is a librarian approach. It's a nerdy approach, yes. Uh, and also, uh, there are many jokes that are still running around about Molla Nasretin, and one of them, I mean, this joke is that you were talking about he was uh, on his donkey, and he was riding the donkey the way around. And people are asking, hey, Molana Sretin, you are sitting on the donkey the way around. And he's uh, just telling, no, the donkey is going in the wrong direction. So uh, in a way, I am very much interested in the critical language or critical, let's say, aura or critical identity, persona or this figure, how it has been borrowed and moved from different countries and how it also survived in time as an image, as a figure, as a kind of language, like a linguistic experience. So taking it not only as a kind of satire, because when you go how publication use the, uh, this figure, the, we see illustrations and we also see texts. And the texts are directly speaking with the reader. And we can say it is already creating a dialogue. When we are talking about how it is also displacing the power, or how the relationship between the reader and between the editorial. Like, they create their kind of political agenda versus social agenda. So I want you to talk about a bit how do you kind of, how do you keep your critical distance to this huge collection, to this huge history? Um, you know, it, it's, uh, it's, it's an interesting story. It took us, because of the kind of the changes in the alphabets in Mola Nasruddin, and the, the, because of the change of the alphabet in the Azari language, it took us quite a long time, uh, basically halfway through our research, about a year into our research, we realized that we actually disagreed with much of the pages of this magazine. So and I think it's very rare that you find people Why? who- Why? Like, give a very concrete example. Well, well um, I mean- uh, Like pro-Western kind of? Yes, it was, mm -hmm. it's very pro-Western. It's very pro, it, well, it's basically, Mola Nasruddin believes that modernity has to be pro a Western modernity. So here you have a typical example. The beginning of course is in a Christian, in a Christian school on the left, and the beginning of course is in a Muslim school on the right. Now, we actually, actually Slavs and Tatars believes in the exact opposite, that you do not need to import modernity, a Western version of modernity. Um, and we're not as violently critical of, of Islam as they are. They're almost, 
in a way, we were quite worried because we thought, in fact, what this might do is it might feed m m even more fi fuel to the fire of people who are Islamophobes today. And I think it's rare that you find people, whether authors, uh, editors, or artists, who devote two years to a publication that they disagree with. We actually fundamentally disagree with many of the points mm -hmm. of this magazine. And I think that... But in terms of the zeitgeist, like how they reflect on the political agenda of their time, yeah, yes, it's, of course it is easy for us to now crit criticize this in the 21st century. At the time, we probably mm. would have been... The magazine was actually part of a movement called Jadidism. Jadidism was a, was a movement of Muslim reformers of the Soviet Union. And, uh, and the Jadidist story is a, very, is, a quite an is a forgotten story that very few people in the West and even in the Soviet Union discuss because the Jadidists believe in kind of rehauling the uh, mu Muslim educational system and they were overrun by the Bolshevik Revolution. So, of course, that rehauling happened anyway as soon as the Bolsheviks arrived, but, but it happened in such a kind of violent way that the Jadidists actually believed in a kind of evolution, and of course the Bolsheviks believed in a kind of bloody, wholesale uh, revolution. And, um, and through the life of the publication, there was a kind of evolution of the ideological perspective in terms of their approach to the modernity. Can we say this? Absolutely, there was. I mean, uh, the, the, magazine's, um, the magazine's quality of the illustrations and, and the tone of the magazine actually suffered a lot after the Bolsheviks arrived, for example. When they saw that these people, they, the magazine was quite left wing, but of course, when the Bolsheviks arrived, they realized that the left wing that they imagined, uh, the progressive agenda they imagined, was not at all the, aligned with the agenda of, the, of those in power. So mm. at some point, the magazine, the, the Bolshevik, uh, the center sort of a uh, the, the central party in Moscow actually asked them to change the name from Ola Nasruddin to uh, al Asiz, meaning uh, atheist. So they asked to change the name of the publication to The Atheist. And of course, that shows the kind of the excesses of, 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 of taking what was already a quite a critical uh, approach to Islam and making it even more so. Um, here actually is uh, Ismail Beg Gasprinsky, who's a Tatar. He was one of, the, one of the founders of Jadidism, as well as the editors of this publication. This is one of my favorite ones we can just quickly show of a. Of, a, of an Azeri man beating his, uh, his Azeri wife and, of course, uh, being beaten by his uh, Russian lover at the same, at the same time. But, um, but I think that in a way, so in a, in a sense, what we try to do maybe is, is rescue Mola Nasruddin, to come back to what you're saying, from, from, uh, this, from this publication to, to, and restore him more to kind of an anti-modernist stance. And what we mean by this notion of anti-modernism is, is, uh, is something that you, you there was a, a quite important book by Antoine Compagnon in 2006 written called Les Antimodernes, and he basically traces through French literary tradition, but you can find it in, in some other, in earlier sources as well, like Jacques Maritain and actually some Catholic writers in the early 20th century, this idea of the real modernists being those who are moving to the future but with, but, but with an eye on the rear view mirror in the way that sort of Sartre described Baudelaire. And you find this, of course, in Benjamin's Angel of History being propelled into the future, facing the past, and even the, uh, the Strangely, the Malagashi language in Madagascar, mm -hmm. the, the words they use to describe the future is not, um, is not in front of us, but the future is always described as, as behind you and the past is in front, mm -hmm. which runs contrary to kind of very Western positivist notions of time where we believe we know where we're going. The future and the past is actually behind us. We, we kind of think it's irrelevant. I have to tell you one of the like, best of jokes from Molana Sretin again. Like, he is pouring yogurt into the lake, and there are some people who are just watching it, and they're asking, Hoja, what are you doing? And he's very much uh, convinced about what he is doing. He's, he's saying that he's fermentizing. He's putting Making the, more he's, yogurt. Yeah, yeah, exactly. He wants to make the yogurt, you know? And they are just laughing, and he, he's very sure. I like his gesture. You would never know what would happen if it would be true. Yeah, you know? I think, in a way, like in terms of critical thinking, how political imagination, how political fiction, and how the language of critics, social critics, has, have been constructed through the page. Uh, I would like to talk about bit this retrospective look. How, how, when you look back in the history, and where, because somehow this, res this research, which is very much based on past, has to be contributing to the future. So, Within your practice, within how Slavs and Tatars function, how Slavs and Tatars operate certain research tools, how do you think it will contribute to our political imagination or like dialogue between different discourses or generations, let's say? Um, Difficult question. <laughs> I, think that, um, I think this idea of embracing your, antith your antithesis or embracing that which you're against is actually quite important. Um, and 
not only in the sense that we were kind of, in, in a sense, antithetical to the to the positions of this publication, but this, but it, what it does is it creates a kind of a, 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 a strategy of equivocation, where where you're actually forced to kind of collide two very extreme thoughts, uh, or or kind of try to kind of combine the extremes. In a sense, what this publication did was try to be ant, be anti-colonial, but at the same time be pro-Western. And of course, that seems to you seems almost mutually exclusive but but that's the kind of the courage of, of the publication was that it was trying to kind of have a basically be seated seated between two chairs in a sense and i think that for us this idea of of embracing your antithesis is actually quite important because it's that's that's a it's a quite basic intellectual pursuit is to read and, and engage with things with which you disagree as a, and um and i think that's probably the the, the, the way it it impacts our work beyond actual pieces that it's inspired let's say linguistic kind of uh, text-based pieces. Because even for me to construct this kind of, formulate this kind of question was difficult. I was thinking to ask a question which will help to release your motivations. Like what was the motivation to deal with this huge history of a publication? Also collecting it, carrying it around, scanning it, dealing with really a kind of, let's say, dying history. I mean, but is it like, I want to... I find it strange, I mean, the, the idea, the, the kind of the, the found one of the founding re, uh, ideas of Slavs and Tatars was not, was, in a sense, to preserve or to talk about what we what we consider to be a very relevant area of the world, a relevant material, which is sort of we 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 claim it's a geographical area, but it can be as much as an imaginative geography between the former Berlin Wall and the Great Wall of China. What's this magazine is very indicative of the practice in the sense that it, it, it's quite astounding that it comes to us as artists in the 21st century to discover a, what's considered to be the most important Muslim periodic of the 20th century. Meaning, why, what's, what's interesting is why this is not uh, discussed more often or, or even made more, more relevant to, to the greater Muslim world, to the Western world, by academics or others. It's, it's actually quite an unknown publication. There, of course, there's been work on it by academics, but it's never been made available in any language. Even in Azerbaijan, it was only ma made available in the past three or four years. Um, so I think that, uh, I think in, for in this case, it's a, pr it's a preservation of, 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 of a preservation, but let's say repositioning it. Because of, of course, a lot of the themes are also very relevant today. Press freedom, of course. You know, this is people. Some people were were quite shy about being involved in the publication because they were they were thinking about the Danish cartoons of the Prophet, for example. And in this case, our our answer was, well, this is very different. This is, of course, uh, a, a kind of a criticism from. A, it's very different when there's criticism from the Muslim world itself. As opposed to kind of an outsider who doesn't really have a relationship with with the uh, with the material that they're so-called uh, crit uh, crit critiquing, um, the idea of obviously gender equality, uh, the idea of, of of education as well. I mean, today we have we're faced with similar issues in madrasas all around uh, Southeast Asia, sorry, South Asia and uh, and some parts of the Middle East. Um, so I don't think that in fact we've progressed very much in a hundred years since since the publication has been um, pu done. And in terms of how politics function, like uh, like we worked last year in Berlin, and we uh, you contribute to an exhibition, uh, and that exhibition we pick up one image from the lecture, and we use that image very much around the city in Berlin, and the image was uh, based on a statement. I mean, let no one represent you. It's an advice to the intellectuals. So, in a way, like. Also considering Mola Nasreddin as part of your practice, how would you comment on the position or role or the need of the intellectual today in terms of how politics function? Like, who is the intellectual? Do we have an intellectual here with us? Or who defines himself or herself as intellectual? Because since Foucault time, nobody's really talking about it that much, and inside, it was a very romantic, very kind of also mm. it was a gesture. I mean, but I f define myself an intellectual. I know that you also define yourself an intellectual, not as a kind of uh, capacity, but as a kind of political identity that you have a responsibility to the uh, discourses that you are involved, like a critical practice. So, yeah, who is an intellectual in terms of Mola Nasreddin? <laughs> well, I, I should first say that um, I think what's interesting in this again in this area of the world. Whether it's a former, former Soviet sphere or, 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 or kind of greater Eurasia, the word intelligentsia still exists, which is quite a, which, which is it's something that we don't find in the West in any case, and, and even less and less in Russia and the, the Caucasus and the former Soviet Empire. 
um, the um, and it functions within the system. You mean absolutely. Like, I mean, uh, in in fact, state, because of media. And in, uh, when there are the lack of those public institutions of critique, whether it's journalism or, or, or kind of universities, the intelligentsia becomes all the more important. I think that, um, that in Mullah Nasruddin's case, what would be an intellectual would be somebody who is able to understand complexity, as, as I think it was Pascal who said, uh, who said that uh, the, the measure of, a, of an intelligence of a man is how much doubt he can tolerate afford, or yeah. afford. Um, but I think what's important in Mullah Nasruddin's case is is, uh, is humor, and I think that that's quite important in our practices, is the intellectual who has to be able to, uh, in a sense, use humor uh, as a kind of, as a disarming critique or as a kind of seductive critique. First, by, by humor, you reel people in and sort of seduce them, in a sense, and then you can actually be more pedagogical, because if you, if you start out being pedagogical, nobody, ca nobody wants to be taught a lesson. No, people are tired of being schooled, in a sense, once they finish their schooling, so in, later in life, in adult life, it's, it's often through humor that you can begin to sort of tell those stories. But I tell you, even in the national educational perspective of Turkish Republic, Molla Nasrettin was such a vivid live figure that none of these pedagogical pedant discourses could kill his humor. I mean, when it was a kind of book that is given to us as a kind of a history book, all the people in my class go immediately to the Mullah Nasrettin page. We know, we, we were there, we were personalizing, we liked it, you know. It was a vivid, live figure for us. It's, so I don't, in a way, I agree with you in terms of this pedagogical uh, approach, but in this case, like Mullah Nasrettin, no one can kill that humor. It's, it's very strong. It's, I think it was also never history, in a way. Yeah, and I th uh, it's true, but I think if we bring it to an art context, the, idea, the role of humor I mean, intellectually, humor is not considered serious. Most, uh, many intellectuals don't consider humor to be, you cannot be funny and serious at the same time. That's considered to be kind of almost, mutual, almost impo an impossible task. I don't think that's the case. And I, don't, I don't think that those who've grown up with Mullah and Asherdeen would also argue that you have to be serious to be critical. Um, so, yeah. Well, we should open it up for yeah. questions. Are there any questions? It was very clear. <laughs> well, where they can buy the book? Um, well, right across right. In the, at, the, at the bookshop. How is here. it going with the sales? Is it available on Amazon? <laughs> and it's a book lounge. I mean, sorry. Um, what's 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 nice? <laughs> Practical. It's been what's been very nice has been uh, has been that uh, there's been a quite an interesting quite a response from. Um, the, the the world outside the art world, meaning the we ha um, the literary world, the kind of the academic world, uh, has been quite responsive to it. And we're we're basically using the book as a kind of as a platform of discussion throughout the year, basically um, both doing a presentation, sometimes linked with works, a library, what we call a library of equivocation, uh, and also doing the, a talk on Mullah Nasruddin. And uh, but um, but it's it's quite refreshing to get sort of to get. Uh, Quite a sustained interest from people like the New Yorker and the uh, Asian Review of Books and uh, and your more literary crowd, but I think it, in a sense it speaks to them as well. So. And who did you connect to through Mola Nasrettin? Like, what kind of network? What kind of interest? What kind of reader profile it developed for Slavs and Tatars? Like, who approached you with with the? I don't think that Mola Nasrettin helps clarify what we do any more <laughs> than any other any of our other publications. Project, but yeah. I think. This idea of indistinguishability is probably something we'll maintain, hopefully, in our practice forever. Is that I think it's important to to be doing things that, that people don't expect you to do, and you yourself don't expect yourself to do. So, I mean, this is this, in fact, reinforces that some of the some people think that Slavs and Tatars is, is purely a, an ac a kind of an, a curatorial or an academic research group, uh, and it's 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 not. But uh, but uh, we're we're very happy to kind of uh, muddle the, the 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 path in a way. <coughs> um, can you just talk about where you exactly found the images and then also if there are copyright issues and then sort of proprietary issues related to the translation and yeah, all um, that. so the um, <coughs> the books originally as I mentioned uh, this is how we found them in Baku being, being re reissued and sort of there's basically going to be eight volumes in all at the moment there's five volumes each volume is about five to six hundred pages 
and uh, in all there'll be eight, so about 5,000 pages uh, in all. Um, we found it in a bookshop in, in Baku. It's not difficult to find. That's again, th that shows the little interest, let's say, of this region, because it wasn't like we were actually d uh, discovering something in a, in a lost archive. This is actually available in bookshops book in, uh, in Baku. And, uh, and of course, what they It's still popular. I mean, it's still, still popular, absolutely. Yeah. And, it's, uh, and, um, and of course, back to this question of the Latinization of the alphabet, they had to, um, they had to, uh, they had to, um, they basically Cyrillicized the entire 5,000 pages from Arabic to Cyrillic until 1988. And then 1991 happened, and they realized that they just finished 5,000 pages of Cyrillic, and they had to do it all back into Latin again. So this kind of gargantuan Kafkaesque task of, uh, of, of, um, of making it available to people, what, what this does, this, this segmentarization or, what, or, or sectarianism of the language, what it does, it creates immigrants within Azerbaijan itself, meaning a grandparent, a parent, and a child can speak the same language, but they can't read the same book because they all they all read a different iteration of their own language. Um, as for copyright, we didn't, we didn't even ask that question to ourselves. I mean, people asked us that question, and we just kind of ignored it, because what we believe we're doing is... is but Mola Nasrettin belongs to everyone. He belongs to everybody, that's for sure. Not only Azeris, but... Uh, it's open, but open source. It's open source, it's it's open absolutely. Source. And uh, you know, obviously, this is not a, a highly commercial affair. So if, anything, if anybody comes and asks for copyright, I'll, I'll be happy to show them the bills. Or, I'll, I'll, or <laughs> Lionel would be happy to show them the bills, I'm sure. Any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you.